Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to continue yet more conversation on the singular value decomposition with the next application, which is about best k-fit planes. Okay, and this is related to but not the same thing as linear regression. So this is kind of like but not but not linear regression. Okay, so here's the question that we're going to answer today. Suppose that we have M data points, AM and RN. What is the best fit k-dimensional subspace? to these points. Okay, so you can again imagine that you each data point contains a bunch of information like you go out and collect m data points on different houses and for each house you have n pieces of information, right? Like the square footage, the median income in the neighborhood, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, whatever. So you can think of that data as coming as M points in RN. Okay, and why do I say this is kind of like linear regression? Because what happens when K equals one? When K equals one, you're asking for what's the best fit one dimensional subspace to these points, which sounds a lot like what's the best fit line. Okay, but there are two differences. So let me illustrate this with a picture. Okay, so let's say I take the same points, roughly the same points, I guess. Uh, you know what I could have done? I could have done that, where I just copied the, the image. Okay. In a linear regression, what you're doing is you're looking for the line that minimizes the squares of the vertical distances to the points. So in a linear regression, you would return something like, say something like roughly like this line. This is the linear regression. Um, and what you're minimizing is the squares of these red distances, the vertical distances to the line. And it's true that like what you would, what you did before is you had an unsolvable system AX equals B. And what you did is you projected B onto the column space of A. Uh, column space of A. And um, then you solved AX equals B hat. Right? And the point is that that projection onto the column space of A isn't really in this picture. Because the column space of A, yeah, it's the column space of A isn't really anywhere in this picture. So this is linear regression. What is uh, the question that we're trying to answer today? The question we're trying to answer today is what one dimensional subspace in this case are these points the closest to? And one big difference is that one dimensional subspaces are lines through the origin. So the blue line doesn't count as a subspace because it doesn't go through the origin. So here we need to look at lines that are actually through the origin. So maybe that one there. And by best fit, I'm trying to minimize the distance of these points from this subspace, which means that I should be looking at these perpendicular distances, not, not the vertical distances. Okay, so that's because when I like what I would like to do is I would like to project all these points to a subspace, right? Um, and I want to minimize the distances to that subspace. And you can actually see what I'm projecting to in this picture. In this picture, I'm finding the best fit one dimensional subspace. And the blue thing is the thing that, I, that my projections would be close to. So this is the difference. Okay. But one nice thing is that, uh, this scales up this this idea is easy to scale up in dimension. So if I have 
points sitting in R100, right? Or R10, if I collect 10 data points in every house, then I could ask what's the best two-dimensional plane uh, or what's what's the closest two-dimensional plane to all these data points? And I can imagine that I have like a cloud of data points and there's some plane through the origin that best, that lies as close as possible to those points. Okay, so the question is, how do you find this? We, we already know how to find this. So this side, we're good. But how do we find this? And we just need to do a little bit of analysis here. So the picture here, I'm going to try to pick, copy the picture for the notes. Maybe I'm inside of R2 in this picture. And I have these points. And I'm looking for this line. The line that minimizes these distances. Okay, well, let's take a look at this first point A1, which again, you can think of as a vector, right? So let's think of this vector A1. This is the line L, or the one dimensional subspace L. Let's take a look closely at this picture. So here's the origin. A1 is here. This I'll call D1, or DI, I guess. Okay, this works for, for any of the points. This thing is the length of AI, right? That's the, it's going from the origin to AI. And this thing I'll call PI, this vector, because it's like I'm projecting onto the line. And what I would like to do is I would like to minimize the DIs. And so we, what we want to do is we want to minimize, well, the squares of the DIs. Uh, really, it's the sum. Oh, at, over all the all, all the eyes, right? Well, what is di? The length of di squared. This is a Pythagorean theorem. So this is a right triangle. So the length of di squared is the length of ai squared minus the length of pi squared. Now. The data points, the AIs are given to you, which means that you have no control over this. This can't change. As you change the line, as you change the L, the AIs won't change because those are points that are given to you. What's changing is the PIs and the DIs. Well, if I want to minimize this thing, then what that means is I want to maximize the PI, right? The PI is always going to be smaller than the AI. That's by the triangle inequality. But I want to make this difference as small as possible. That means I want to maximize. So this is the same thing as maximizing the sum of the PI squareds as I go over all possible lines. Okay, so the question, this I could rephrase as, what line L through the origin, because I want it to be a subspace, maximizes the value of the sum of the PI squares, where the PI is the projection of AI onto the line, right? I guess I should write written that. PI here is the projection onto the line L of AI, right? So the question is, which line to the origin maximizes the value sum of the PI squareds. Okay, and this is something that we can actually understand because uh, suppose that L equals the span of V where v is a unit vector, you can always you can always choose v to be a unit vector, right? Well, then we know that if you take the dot product of ai with v, 
So let's say AI transpose V. That's, we know this from calculus, the length of A, I, the length of V times the cosine of the angle between them. But I've chosen V to be a unit vector, so this is just the length of AI times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, but remember this picture? Look at this picture. So here, this is theta. And you'll notice that the length of PI is exactly AI times cosine theta. Right? That's exactly what the length of PI is. So this is exactly the length of PI. So the length of PI, in other words, is just... I guess technically we should be taking the absolute value of AI transpose V because just in case you happen to get a negative number, you don't want the, the length to be negative, right? Which means that uh, PI squared is, I guess I could write it like this, AI transpose V squared. So what I want to minimize is I want to minimize the sum of these guys. So I want to minimize, so I want, what, what I'm trying to say is I want to choose V such that the sum of AI transpose V squared is minimized. Sorry, is maximized. <laughs> okay, but what is this? This uh, is going to be something kind of recognizable. This is the length of the following vector. So I guess I'll write it like this. It's the length of A1 transpose V down to AM transpose V. Right? It's just the sum of the squares of the entries of that vector. Remember, each AI transpose V is just a number. And this is the same thing as the norm, the length of this matrix times V. Because that's exactly how you get that, that vector. So if we, I mean, I guess I never said this at the start. I'm going to put the A's as the rows of a matrix. This is almost always how you represent data in, say, like data science, right? You have each row of your data matrix contains one of your data points. Each of your data points can have like n different things in it, right? M points in Rn. So this is just, so if this is this, which I should have said that from the beginning, this is just the length of AB. Sorry, I should have said squared everywhere, squared. In other words, right, I'm looking for the V, so, what vector V maximizes the length of AB squared? But this is a question now that we can answer because we already know how to maximize this thing. The answer came in the previous section because, I mean, this is the same thing as the, the two norms squared. This is just a vector. It's just the, the two norm of the vector. And we know that the two norm of the matrix was defined to be the max over all unit vectors x of this value. Um, and what we saw was that this uh, two norm of a, the maximum of this value is sigma one, which means that the maximum value of this is sigma one squared, because it's the square of the two norm. And we saw that, well, what vector is the one that actually gets scaled by a factor of sigma one when you multiply by a? It's the first right singular vector. That's the one that gets scaled by a value of sigma one. And that's the largest value that you can get, which means that the vector v that maximizes this thing is v1, the first right singular vector. Okay, so let's state this as a result now that we sort of understand this. So if A, which is A1 transpose down to AM transpose is a vector in Rm by N, 
M rows and columns. Then the best fit line through the origin to the rows of A is L equals span V1, where V1 is the first right singular vector. Okay, this gives us another interpretation of the right singular vectors. Okay, the first interpretation of V1 that we had is that if you look at what A does, it sends a sphere to a hyperellipse in R, right? It sends a sphere in Rn to a hyperellipse in Rm, an R dimensional hyperellipse. And if you look at the longest axis of that R dimensional hyperellipse, V1 is the vector that mapped over to it. That was one interpretation of the first right singular vector. But now we're seeing another interpretation of the first right singular vector, which is if you imagine your data points as points in Rn, m points in Rn, then the line that they lie closest to is the span of the first singular vector. So the first singular vector is sort of telling you which line best approximates your data in some way. Right, you you have um, right even it's going to be impossible for me to draw the three dimensions, but you have a bunch of points right sitting out here. Uh, maybe I should try to put them roughly somewhat close to some something that looks like a line. You've got all these points, and they of course don't lie on a line almost ever. There's tons of points. Maybe I should have done this in a different color. I don't I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, I'm not going to do that in the color, but the point is that the first singular vector is like whichever line best approximates these data points. They're lying, if you had to pick a line to approximate where the data points were, you would choose the first right singular vector. And this is very useful, right? Because in general, this is a very high dimensional space, right? Again, you collect. 13 pieces of information on every house. I think that's actually, there's some standard data set out there for data science where they collect 13 values for, for a bunch of houses in Boston or something. Um, then you have a bunch of points in R13. But maybe they lie fairly close to some two or three dimensional subspace, in which case that two or three dimensional subspace is sort of telling you where your data is. And it's a much smaller dimensional thing. So the first approximation would be the best fit line, but then you could also ask, what about the best fit plane, the best fit two-dimensional plane, the best fit three-dimensional plane? Okay, and again, the picture that I want you to have in mind is you have some high-dimensional space and you have a bunch of points lying out in this high-dimensional space. These are data points. They could, they're all over the place and they're in high dimension, but it's possible that they all lie very close to some plane, and the singular value decomposition tells you which plane to take such that your data points are close to that plane, as close as possible. And that's kind of good because now you have a like a low dimensional thing to work with. And so if you were to predict uh, other housing prices or something, you should also expect that it lies close to this plane. In other words, you could just project the vector onto this plane, and that should uh, some this plane somehow cap. This is the plane of housing price information in Boston, right? So the result is we're not going to prove it, but it's sort of believable from this proposition. The higher dimensional analog is the following thing. I'll set it as a theorem because it's the it's stated that way in the notes. It's also the 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 more general result. So let A1 through AM in Rn be the rows of the matrix A. Where A has rank R. Okay, so now for each K between one and R, less than, less than or equal to, I think I want less than or equal to, 
let vk be the span of the first k singular vectors, right singular vectors, right? This is a subspace of Rn. And it turns out that this subspace is exactly the k-dimensional subspace that minimizes the distance, the sum of the square distances to the points. Again, in the sense of perpendicular distance to the subspace. The right-hand picture, not the left-hand picture. Okay, then the best fit k-dimensional subspace to the rows of A is VK. Right, so i.e. the one that minimizes orthogonal distance some of the squares uh, sum of squares of orthogonal distances from the AIs to the plane, to the subspace. Okay, and this is, a again, a very valuable way to think about what the right singular vectors are telling you. The right singular vectors are telling you, take the span of the first few, that's the best low dimensional plane in terms of approximating the data that you have. This is the picture you should think of, one of the pictures you should think of when you think of a singular value decomposition. Okay, now that's the right singular vectors. What about the left singular vectors? Well, basically, everything you can say about the right singular vectors, a similar thing is true of the left singular vectors, maybe with some transposes involved. So this is talking about the rows of A. You could talk about the columns of A. And then you would be talking about the left singular vectors. So uh, what about the column? Sorry, what about left? The point is that... Uh, if A is U sigma V transpose, then A transpose is V sigma transpose U transpose. And then these are the, now the columns, sorry, now the rows of U are the left singular vectors of A, but they're the right singular vectors of A transpose. So since we already have a theorem that tells us about the right singular vectors of a matrix, the left singular vectors of A are just the right singular vectors of another matrix, namely the transpose. So in other words, uh, if we let UK be the span of the first K left singular vectors, then the best fit K plane or K dimensional subspace to the columns of A is UK. Okay, now there's a, a running example through the notes where you've been doing a very simple, straightforward singular value decomposition, one that you can actually see. And so you should also work through the example to see, so it's a four by four example. So you see the best line is some line through the origin. The best plane is also some very easy plane to see. The best three dimensional plane um, you can also kind of see. Okay, so you should run through that example, but the picture that I have in mind, right? This is the picture that I have when I think of singular value decomposition. It's the right-hand picture here, as well as the one with the hyperellipses. Somehow telling you a lot about the rows or the columns of A. And it's telling you, the SVD tells you in order, <laughs> right? The first one is the most important thing to know about the rows of A in the sense that that's the one direction that sort of explains most of the direction that the rows of A are living in. The second one is the second most important, but those two together will tell you sort of the, the two-dimensional plane that the rows of A are living in the, the closest. Okay, this will become even a bit more clear when next time we talk about principal component analysis, which is essentially this idea.
Okay, but let me also mention the following important result, which is related to this. So now uh, we know that... Sorry, I'm going to bring this back to um, rank, low rank approximations to A. Right, so we know that A you can write as the sum from... Okay, let, let me, I should say, suppose that's rank R. Right, so we know that A you can write as the sum of the singular value, the left singular vector, transpose the right singular vector. This is just an equality. This basically follows from the reduced SVD. And we know that uh, we can take just the first K of them, and that gives us a good low rank approximation to the matrix A. This is the best rank K approximation in terms of the two norm, the distance to A. Turns out though that this matrix has another meaning. The rows of AK are the projections of the rows of A onto the subspace VK that I de defined in, in the previous theorem. So another interpretation of this rank K approximation is that you've just taken the rows of A and you've projected them onto the best fit K dimensional subspace, which explains why the images that we were looking at at the end of last time are so good, right? The point is, is that we are approximating um, you take the image that those are just a, a bunch of uh, this 800 vectors in R 1200, 800 vectors in R 1200, but they all lie fairly close to some 100 dimensional subspace. That's where I took 100 singular values. And that 100 dimensional subspace is very close somehow to those 800 points in R 1200. And what is this low rank approximation? It's like I took all the points and I projected them down to that 100 dimensional subspace, right? In this picture, what I did is I took all these points and I just projected them down a little bit onto this subspace, right? And I took these vectors instead. Those are the rows of <laughs> this picture now is, you can't even see anything on this picture, but they're all lying off of those a little bit. We projected it down. And those became the rows of the matrix. And so sort of, of course, that matrix should be kind of close to the original matrix. That's why the picture is, the pictures were as good as it was, because this was the approximation. What we did is we just projected the rows of A onto a subspace that they were relatively close to, the best subspace that you could possibly take. And so that's roughly the same thing as A. It's a really good approximation of A. Okay, and we can prove this. It's just some, <laughs> it's just some linear algebra. So let uh, AI be some, sorry, yeah, let AI be some row of A, the i row of A. Okay, so now we know that the left sing, sorry, the right singular vectors v1 through k we know that these are orthonormal so they form an orthonormal basis of vk their span uh, for vk and now based on the projection problems from the problem sets we know how to project a onto VK if you have an orthonormal basis. So if you have an orthonormal basis, projection becomes very easy. It's just the following thing. You just take the matrices that you get from VI, v tra VI transpose, and you multiply them by A, and you add them all together. So this is only true because this is an orthonormal basis. All right, so this one is, since orthonormal, 
And now you can write this uh, as a row vector by just transposing everything, right? So let's transpose everything. So this thing transpose. When you transpose, you have to flip the order. So this is A transpose V1, V1 transpose, plus A transpose VK, VK transpose. Uh, but I've forgotten my I's, AI. So this is AI. You can do this for every row AI, right? This is prediction of AI. Now, if I want to project every row onto a transpose, then I have to, sorry, onto VK, then I need to take the A1, A2, A3 down to a an M, a M, which is the number of columns, sorry, which is the number of rows of A. We have M vectors in Rn, right? So the matrix that I'm interested in is the one like this. So the first one is A1, BI, BI, right? Down to I equals one to K of AM transpose VI, VI. Maybe I shouldn't have used I in two places for, to mean two different things. Let's call this J. So it's A1, VJ transpose, a1 transpose vj down to uh, like this, right? Again, here I just did it for i. So you do it for one, that's the first row. You do it for two, that's the second row. You do it for three, that's the third row. Down to m, that's the mth row. This is the matrix whose rows are the projections of the rows of a onto vk. This is the matrix that we want. Okay, but now let me pull out the sum. So let's pull out this sum. And now uh, what I'm left with here is uh, A1 transpose VJ. Uh, I missed, sorry, I'm missing the transposes here. VJ transpose down to AM transpose VJ, VJ transpose. Right, it's the sum of m. Sorry, it's the sum of k different matrices. Where uh, you, the first one is all v1s, the second one is all v2s, the third one's all v3s, etc. And then convince yourself that this is the same thing as the sum from j equals one to k of a times vj times vj transpose. This is just uh, if you do the multiplication in this matrix, you'll see that it's exactly doing. I mean, if you do all the <laughs> multiplications of this matrix, you see it's doing the exact same thing as this matrix multiplication times VJ multiplied by VJ transpose. So that's just a thing that you need to check. Now we're at a good point, though. Remember, the other way to think about the right singular vectors is when you multiply A by one of the right singular vectors, you get exactly the R-dimensional hyperellipse, the axis of the R-dimensional hyperellipse. The vjth one will end up having length, a vj will end up having length sigma j in the direction of uj. So a vj, this thing here, is sigma j uj. So therefore we'll have the sum j equals 1 to k of sigma j uj vj transpose. This was exactly the rank k approximation this thing was exactly a k. You add up the first k, and you do this with the first k singular values and singular vectors. So the matrix we want, which was the projection of the rows of a onto the k-dimensional subspace, ended up just being this rank k approximation that came from using the first k pieces of the singular value decomposition. And so this uh, computation shows that this proposition is true which is another way to think about the best rank K approximation. Okay. Now, I think I would like to just spend a full lecture on principal component analysis next time. So maybe I'll stop here, give y'all a little break. We're 23 lectures in, 
the lectures have been long. Why don't we stop here? Uh, next time we'll continue talking about SVD. I think maybe for one more lecture, we'll talk about principal component analysis. All right, see you then.